Imagine today is a ridiculously hot and sunny day. I have a snowball with me, and let's say I toss that snowball into the distance. Before the snowball even has a chance to reach the ground, it completely melts away because it's so hot outside. There's actually some elementary particles that exist up there in the heavens, and they only have a lifespan of about two, one millionth of a second before they completely disintegrate. Yet, that detector up there is able to detect it. How can it do that? Well, let's figure that out in today's episode. So here I am at the top of Sulphur Mountain in Banff, Alberta, where right behind me there's a cosmic ray detector. It's used to detect for tiny little particles called muons, roughly the size of that of an electron particle. Fuzzy little creature, do you see that? Where's the fuzzy creature? Where's the fuzzy creature? Hi buddy! Hey fuzzy creature! Oh, he disappeared. Oh. So what exactly is a muon? Well, it's an elementary particle, like that of an electron. Unfortunately, here on Earth, it doesn't survive for very long. It only lasts for about two one millionths of a second before completely disappearing. However, it does have one advantage. It's able to travel really fast. It's capable of traveling at roughly 99% of the speed of light. Yet when you go through the math of those two, that translates to around 700 meters before it completely vaporizes. There's a detector up there that still can detect it from as far as four kilometers away. So how's that possible? Well, Einstein once mentioned that as particles travel really fast, close to the speed of light, it begins to buy itself some extra time, also known as time dilation. Let's go through that math together. Consider this. Imagine that there's a guy who's sitting in a cart and he's going to toss a ball to a lovely lady out in the distance. Let's say this gentleman, George, is traveling at a rate of 10 meters per second and is able to toss the ball at a speed of 15 meters per second. You would expect the ball to be traveling at the sum of these two values, which works out to 25 meters per second. And this is completely true in the world of classical relativity, or relative velocity. Let's take a look at the second scenario, where I give George a flashlight instead. Now George shines the flashlight in the direction of Helen, but he is now traveling much, much faster. Let's say he's traveling at 10% the speed of light. What would the speed of light be as it passes by Helen? Many of us would assume that the speed of light would also increase by 10%, up to 3.3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. However, that's not the case. Instead, what happens here is that both George and Helen will see the light traveling at the speed of light from their own perspectives. This weird phenomenon is described in the special theory of relativity, where in the second postulate, it states that no matter what frame of reference you are in, you will always observe the speed of light traveling at 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. This also brings up another interesting question. How does George appear to Helen? Although Helen would observe the light emitting from George's green face at 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, the waves of light will get compressed due to George's motion. And as a result, the frequency of light increases and the color of light coming from his face will shift to the ultraviolet spectrum. Yes, the same type of light that may result in skin damage. So make sure that you wear sunscreen on a sunny day. And if you've ever seen this type of nerdy t-shirt before, hopefully now you get the reference to it. This is an example of a Doppler shift, where a fast-moving object moving towards you will shift to the blue end of the color spectrum. This will also cause things to change in the reference of time. Let's say that in this second scenario, I give George two mirrors that are vertically stacked and parallel to one another. And I give George a laser pointer too. If George points the laser pointer towards the bottom mirror, the ray of light will bounce back and forth, back and forth between the two mirrors and eventually exit. But that's because he's shining it diagonally. George, can you kneel on one knee? Perfect. And that's exactly what we should expect from George's perspective. That as George is shining the light while he's traveling on the track, the ray of light will travel upwards and then straight back down again. But what exactly does Helen see? We know that in truth, Helen cannot see the ray of light itself, but for argument's sake, let's just say that she can see the path of the light as it travels. And this is what she will observe. The ray of light is not just going up and down. Rather, it's going along the hypotenuse of two triangles. So the distance of the light that has to travel now is much longer. This is a great way to emphasize the orthogonality between space and time. Before we move on, Let's first describe the two perspectives of time. George sees the time as proper time. In other words, the activity begins and ends in the same spot. We can imagine George as if he is sitting inside a box and is completely impervious of his motion.
Helen, on the other hand, sees a form of time that is stretched out, and that's why we call it dilated time. Okay, now let's do the math. So from George's perspective, he sees the time of light experiment as double the height of the mirrors divided by the speed of the light. On the other hand, Helen sees the distance as the sum of the hypotenuse of the two triangles divided by the speed of light. Pulling out Pythagorean's theorem, we calculate the length of the hypotenuse as the root of the base squared plus height squared of the triangle. Then to find out the total time, we double the hypotenuse and divide by the speed of light. Combine the red and blue formula together from both sides, and through lots of algebra, you'll end up getting this magical formula in the middle, known as the time dilation formula. This brings up another interesting story as told supposedly by Albert Einstein, where when someone asked him about what exactly relativity was, he gave this response. Imagine yourself placing your hand on a stove for a minute. It'll feel like an hour. Talk with a pretty girl for an hour, and it'll seem like just a minute passed by. That's relativity. There are these two videos that I'd like to share with you, but that's all I could share with you here, and here, because of copyright infringement. Links in the description below. But what I can show you are the calculations that we talked about earlier. So muons are these tiny little cosmic particles from space that are about 200 times more massive than an electron. They can also travel at nearly the speed of light. One consequence is that as they travel through our atmosphere, they end up getting absorbed by the air in the atmosphere and decay in about two millionths of a second. So how can they exactly reach near the surface of the Earth and be detected? Because if we go according to classical physics, well, we know that the total distance is equal to speed times time. So traveling at 99% of the speed of light multiplied by 2.2 microseconds, and you get roughly around 650 meters, and that's it. It completely decays, and it has no chance in reaching the surface of the Earth. However, at that observation tower at the top of Sulphur Mountain, they were still able to detect the presence of muons. So how were they able to detect it? Well, since the muons are traveling so fast, they experience time dilation. So let's go through that calculation. If the speed of a muon travels at 99% of the speed of light, and the time that it takes for it to travel is 2.2 microseconds, well, how far can it travel? First off, we need to find out the relativistic time from the Earth's perspective. So we sub all the values in and we crunch it out. And we find that even though the muon can only survive 2.2 microseconds through our atmosphere, from the Earth's perspective, it sees it as living a whole lot longer, about seven times longer. So multiplying by the speed of light by 15.6 microseconds now, well, that buys us quite a bit more distance, and that's how we're still able to detect it at the top of Sulphur Mountain. There's actually a second way that muons can buy themselves some extra time, and that's known as length contraction. Let's go through that math as well. Here's an example of length contraction. Let's say that Helen is gazing towards George. What exactly does she see? Well, to her, she sees a handsome, strapping young gentleman, because from her perspective, she sees George as a rather slender man. So what exactly is going on here? Well, while George is moving, his width appears a lot slimmer from Helen's perspective. This is known as length contraction. Let's talk about these two perspectives of lengths. We have the proper length, which is the length that George observes because he's essentially sitting inside a shoebox and he's impervious to his motion. And we have the contracted length, which is from Helen's perspective because she sees the shoebox moving and as a result, it appears a lot more slender. Here are the two corresponding equations. As a memory aid, anytime that you see this knot symbol here or the circle here, it always is in reference to the actual object itself or how it sees itself while at rest. Now, if you sub the equations into the time dilation formula, you end up with this new formula in the middle. One thing is a reminder, the length contraction only happens in the same direction of motion. So George only gets more slender. He will not get shorter in this situation here. However, if he decides to orient himself like this, then yeah, from Helen's perspective, he'll look like a short, stubby man. Here's another example. Let's say a spaceship is traveling at warp 0.7 of the speed of light, and it only appears to be about 78 meters from Earth's perspective. Question is, what is the true length of the spaceship, or what is the rest length of the spaceship? How would I give you a moment to calculate through this? 
Did you get that answer? As a reminder, we're trying to look for the rest length, or L0. So we need to take this equation and bring the square root down to the denominator before solving. Hi guys, I'm Jade. Yep, again, that's all I can show you due to copyright infringement. Link in the description below as well. But what we can go through here are the calculations. This time round from the perspective of length contraction. So as the muon is moving towards us, from our perspective, it has to travel very far in order to be detected at around 4.6 kilometers. But as we sub the values into the length contraction formula, the muon feels like it only has to travel through about 0.65 kilometers. So in other words, the fast muon sees its journey as much shorter. And that's why the detector at the top of sulfur melton is still able to detect it. So we can solve this problem in either of these two perspectives. Well, I hope they enjoyed today's episode. For more adventures like this, make sure you like, click, subscribe, hit that bell button, and whatever else that YouTube demands you to do. Until our next adventure together, let's continue to enjoy this beautiful view at the top of Sulphur Mountain in Banff, Alberta. You can see the river core. Okay, let's open this up. Oh, look at the pressure in here. Oh man. Oh, there we go. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're done. Yeah, very nice. <laughs>